I want to tell you about the worst meal I've ever had. Two years ago, I was out for dinner with my daughter Lila and my son Rourke. My wife Sheridan was on her way back from the airport from work. So there we were, Lila telling one of her funny little stories. When mid-sentence, her hands just froze, like this. And I was like, Lila, Lila, are you okay? And she just toppled off the side of her chair, just like the electricity had been pulled from her body. I screamed out for her, Lila, Lila, and she started shaking uncontrollably on the ground. And I yelled out for someone, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. And as she was shaking, I was reached down towards her and she stopped shaking and she was just limp. I just hugged her and I just hugged her. Somehow at that point, I was able to gather my thoughts. Maybe she choked on something. We were mid-conversation. She was eating something. Maybe she had something lodged in her throat. So I reached around towards her head and I tried to open her jaw, but it was completely clenched shut, completely shut, jammed. And I pulled, I pulled, and I was able to wrench her jaw open and some blood trickled out. And I was like, what the hell's that? I don't know what that is. And then at the same time, I could hear my son, Rourke, in the corner of the restaurant, just crying and crying, wailing. And I was like, Rourke, it's okay. She's going to be okay. She's going to be all right. She is. But in my heart, I thought Lila was dead. I thought, well, if not dead, she was brain dead at the best. In this mad panic, another person who was having dinner handed me their phone and said, it's triple zero. They got an ambulance on the way. It's triple zero. Talk to them. They asked me if she was still breathing. I leant down and I just could hear the whisper, this mere shallowest whisper of her breath. So she was breathing. But was she responding to anything? No. Then I had another brainwave. I thought, Lila, Lila, mummy's on her way. Stay awake for mummy. And finally, she sort of slightly opened her eyes and I was like, it's a glimmer of life there. Maybe I just keep saying that. Lala, stay away from mummy. Stay away from mummy. She's coming. She's coming. And that's when mummy walked in the door. That's when Shira arrived. And she rushed towards Lala, picked her up as I tried to explain what had gone on. And she instinctively just cuddled her and made her feel safe. And Lala just cuddled into mummy. You could tell there was something there. And then I thought about Rourke crying in the corner of the restaurant. I thought, I need to protect him from this moment. So I took him outside. I didn't want him to see what was going on. And I said, Rourke, let's go outside. Let's go outside. Let's see if we can find the ambulance. She's going to be okay. The ambulance is coming. We need to make sure we can see it. It honestly felt like half an hour before the paramedics arrived, but it was probably five minutes. They carried Lila to the ambulance. Me and Sherry looked at each other and we kind of mirrored each other's grief. We just knew something horrible had happened and we didn't know what was going to happen next. And I said to Sherry, I'll take Rourke home and organise Nan and Pop to look after him and I'll meet you at the hospital. But the ambulance didn't move. I peered in through the window and all I could see were Lila's two feet just lying beneath two ambos and Sherry. Sherry looked out at me and shook her head. She was having another seizure. And then, after a few more minutes, another ambulance arrived. Like, why is another ambulance arriving? Why aren't they going? I turned to Rourke again and said, Lila, is going to be okay. She's going to be okay. Trust me. Eventually, the ambulance drove off and I was able to take Rourke home. I called up their nan and pop, explained to them what the hell was going on, which I didn't really know, and arranged for them to come over and help. When I got to the Royal Children's, I had the agonising weight of trying to find out where she was. It had been four hours since Lila had collapsed the floor. Four hours since the worst meal of my life. And finally, I was able to find her. Finally, I was able to walk around the corner and see she was alive. She was alive. But she didn't even recognise me at all. In fact, she cuddled into her mama even more. In fact, she was confused. She didn't know who I was. She couldn't talk. She was afraid of who I was. But she was alive. Nothing else mattered. She was alive. And so this began a journey for myself, for my family and for Lila, trying to find answers. Over the next few months, she had eight of these tonic-clonic seizures. That's what they're called. She had ECGs, she had EEGs, and geez, it was tiring. After her second tonic-clonic, they confirmed that she had epilepsy. But they didn't know why. She also started making this sound. She started just sort of mid-conversation going, huh. And then she'd be back. She'd do this 40, 50 times a day. When she did one of these, when she was doing a test in an EEG, the operator saw the brain pattern, saw the extra electricity in her brain and said, oh, that's an absence seizure. 
And when she thought about that, she's having 50 of those a day. How bad is that going to be for her development? So we need to do something for her. So as part of our journey, we found this group called Epilepsy Action Australia. And they're just amazing people, amazing hearts of gold. And they sent Lila a range of stuff to try and help her and us to destigmatise what she now had. We learned that more than 250,000 Australians have epilepsy. That's 1% of our country. 1%. Think about that for a second. If a quarter of a million Aussies have this neurological disorder, then I bet if you asked around, one of your friends has it. Perhaps your auntie, your uncle, your niece, a nephew, someone at school, someone you work with. Perhaps your daughter has it. One in 10 Australians will also have a seizure in their lives, just out of the blue. 300 people a year die from their epilepsy in Australia. It's pretty frightening stuff. As part of their care for us, Epilepsy Action Australia also sent Lila this bear called a cuddly Ted E bear. And the E stands for epilepsy. Every March they hold a day for epilepsy awareness called Purple Day. It's their big fundraiser for the year. It's always held in March and Lila is so excited by it. She had arranged for her entire school to have an epilepsy Purple Day. Then COVID hit and all the Purple Days shut down across the nation. All of the planned events, gone where people get together and donate, finished. The thing is, epilepsy didn't stop for Lala. She still took her medicine. She still couldn't swim alone. She still couldn't climb trees. She couldn't be left alone in the shower. And she was devastated that all of her schoolmates couldn't celebrate Purple Day with her. She is just one of the 250,000 people who that was taken away from them. So I decided to do something. I remembered that Lala loved her baby bear. I also figured that because of COVID, a lot of people were going to be short of money. But you know who still has a lot of money in a global pandemic and an economic downturn? Billionaires. Am I right? They've got all the cash in the world. Not only do this 1% still have lots of money, they significantly increased their wealth during the last year. So this is where Max comes in. Now you know why I've got him here. He's named Maximilian because he's the million dollar teddy bear. He's a teddy bear just like Lila's baby bear, but with a twist. He's dressed by Christian Kimber, who's the 2019 National Designer of the Year. So he looks like a million bucks. I think we can all agree. Christian's brother also happens to have epilepsy. So Lila and I had originally hoped that a billionaire or a philanthropist with a heart of gold would make a tax deductible donation of $1 million and buy Max to help the 250,000 Australians like my beautiful Lila with epilepsy. The lucky 1% helping the unlucky 1%. Max really tried to get out there and find a home. We made videos, we posted on social media, set up a sweet website, emailed the wealthy 1%. He was even written about in articles all over the world. I guess I figured and Lila figured that because every Aussie on the Australian Financial Review rich list has a net wealth of over a billion dollars in 2020, maybe the lucky 1% would step up and help the unlucky 1% in these extraordinary times. Sadly, we haven't yet been able to find an amazing billionaire with a heart of gold to help out Lila and the quarter of a million Aussies with epilepsy. Yet. Because now, Lila and I are turning our attention to the 99%. We're turning to you guys. It's time for every Aussie out there to share in the bear. Because if there's one thing us Aussies are good at, it's at pulling together and helping those out in need. So if you have two bucks, five bucks, a hundred bucks, 50 bucks, or maybe a thousand dollars, or maybe even $355,733.26, go to milliondollarteddybear.com and donate to Share in the Bear. Because the more you share in the bear, the more it shows Australians care about the 250,000 Australians living with epilepsy, like my beautiful Lila. Here she is, <laughs> Lila. Lila is a special girl. She's a special girl. And she's taught me that life is about never, ever, ever giving up. Life is about helping others. And life is about always trying to keep that ray of sunshine alive. So listen to your heart, like Lila does, and let's find Max a home. I think we can do it. I know we can do it. Together, we can do anything we put our minds to. <laughs>